Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's virtual roundtable on Asian law. Um, my name is Jacqueline Neal. I'm the director of the Center for Asian Legal Studies. So today's uh, virtual roundtable is a discussion of the book, Routledge Handbook of Freedom of Religion and of Belief, this book, as well as a celebration of its editors for bringing to fruition such a tremendous collection. Um, this book comprises 19 chapters spanning multiple regions, multiple religious perspectives, as well as taking into account a variety of different um, aspects of this right to freedom of religion or belief. Um, today, we have all the editors with us. So um, thank you to all the editors, Mark Hill, Silva Ferrari, um, Arif Jamal, and Rosella Batoni for being here with us. And we have also um, three commentators, and uh, one of them is and Black, Professor Anne Black, who is from the University of Queensland, who will be moderating today's session, as well as uh, Professor Melissa Crouch and uh, Professor Nadir Shah Hossein. So I will now hand it over to Anne to uh, introduce the rest of the speakers and to moderate today's session. So Anne, on to you. Thank you, Jacqueline, for the welcome to everyone and for all who are joining us from around the world today. And I'm delighted to be able to moderate this session. It's quite an honour to be part of this round table with so many distinguished speakers and contributors. I think it's a testament too to the vibrancy of CALS and your directorship and all the scholars at NUS in this space of law and religion that you've maintained this series throughout this difficult time. I think this is number 14 of the round table. So I think that's a great attribute. Um, to all of you. Before I introduce our speakers and the format for today's roundtable, I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Anne Black. I'm an Associate Professor of Law at the TC Burns School of Law at the University of Queensland, Australia. And my research area is on Islamic law, especially in Brunei and also here in Australia. I'm also the Executive Director of Comparative Law at our Centre of Public International and Comparative Law at UQ, where we have a growing, small, but growing law and religion research cluster led by Professor Nicholas Aroni. And we're hoping to strengthen our collaborative links with centres like yours and with other law and religion scholars everywhere. So there are three components to today's round table to discuss this Rutledge Research Handbook on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And the four editors, as you know, are with us, Professors Silvio Ferrari and Mark Hill QC and Associate Professors Arif Jamal and Rossella Bottini. And I'll introduce them more fully shortly. But before I do that, the first part of today's round table is a commentary session where we have three speakers from three Australian universities, but from different states in Australia, reflecting on the themes in this book. In the second part, each editor will respond. And then the third component is open to everyone in the Q&A session. So we'll have 30 minutes there where you can use the Q&A function that's on your screen and you write your question and to whom it was directed. So let me start um, by introducing the commentators in the first part here. So I'll be starting and I'll be followed by Professor Melissa Crouch from the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales, where she runs the Southeast Asia Law and Policy Forum. She's a leading scholar and we know her well in the field of comparative constitutional law, law and society, and of course, law and religion. And she's explored in particular the interactions between Islam and Buddhism in Southeast Asia, with special focus on Myanmar and on Indonesia. Our next commentator is Dr. Nadia Hosen from the Faculty of Law at Monash University. 
Now, Nadia is doubly qualified with not one but two PhDs. His first in law from Wollongong University and his second PhD in Islamic law at the National University of Singapore. Now, he's internationally known for his expertise in Sharia and in Indonesian law. And he's much loved in Indonesia, where I'm told his Twitter following exceeds 400,000 followers, which is about equal to our Prime Minister. So well done, Nadia. So with this commentary segment, I'm going to consider the handbook from an editorial perspective. Melissa and Nadir will address some specific areas of content. Actually, this concept of the research handbook is relatively new. I hadn't come across it until Nadir, who was an early adopter, asked me to contribute a chapter to his research handbook on Islamic law and society. I think, Arif, you also had a chapter in that book as well. And that's been a terrific resource for both teaching and research. And having read the chapters in this book, and I have, this new handbook, which we're discussing today or tonight, wherever it is, where you are, will become the go-to book, I'm sure, for legal comparativists, researchers, and students of law and religion. Now, the editors, you quite rightly, I think, described it as, a repository for authoritative and original thinking where different views can be espoused with integrity. And I think that was an apt description because there's no group think here that permeates the book. It seems to me a bit like a cross between a special edition of a journal or four sort of special editions brought together in one volume. So I think it's very successful in each person having an authentic voice and reflecting their own research dynamics. Now, for my segment, as it's the Olympics, I've got three comments and they correlate with the IOC, inclusiveness, organisation and comprehensive coverage. So with inclusiveness, Obviously, the big five religions each have a dedicated chapter, so Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism and Judaism. But what I loved about the book was how it teases out the parameters of religion and belief. So included in the book are traditional beliefs of pre- and post-colonial Africa and how they bind their communities in that continent together and also Indigenous religious practices as they're woven into everyday thought and action within those communities. Sort of a whole way of life, akin in some ways to Islam, rather than this separate sphere as we see it in the West. And also minority religion, religious traditions are not excluded in the book. So, for example, all the Asian religions of Sikhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shintoism, they're also woven in through different chapters. Now, this inclusiveness, I think, is highlighted in some way by Carolyn Sagessa's chapter on secular humanism. It's not something you naturally see in a book on religion, but she rightly points out that you can't protect freedom of religious belief without protecting freedom from religion and without allowing freedom of unbelief. And that sort of struck a chord with me because secular humanism seems to embody sort of ethics of goodness into its comprehension or conception of secularism. Um, and it grew out of a reaction to the power that religious institutions had and acquired within societies, the control they wielded over individuals and the alliances that they formed with the state, state and church, state and mosque, state and temple. And it made me immediately think of Russia, where President Putin's brace of Greek orthodoxy seems to be an alliance of mutual benefit. Blasphemy is now a criminal offence in Russia. The constitution was amended last year to make belief in God a core national value. 
So excuse the pun, but this chapter was quite a revelation for me. And I thought it was a good balance for this handbook, especially as in nations like my own here in Australia, we have no belief as our largest belief or as our growing belief. Um, so 32% of Australians hold no belief and it's even higher amongst the 18 to 30-year-olds. So my second point, the O, is on organisation. Now, I'm sure the editors would have debated the constituent parts of this book, but I think in your format and the way it was put together, you've succeeded. And you said the aim was to locate freedom of religion and belief across time and across place. So part one situates freedom of religion historically. Now, this was just a compelling and fascinating part of the book. It was sort of almost unstoppable um, in how interesting it was. And part three deals with the place, with the geopolitical and regional dimensions from the West, from Asia and also Africa. Part two gives us a focus analysis on how each religion conceives of that freedom. And that's something I hadn't seen anywhere else. And then it's complemented with big picture chapters. So in sections four and five, we have the dynamics of religious freedom in conjunction with constitutions, international bodies, and also. Um, Sharma's chapter looks at or seeks a commonality, a sort of an interreligious notion of the right to freedom of religion, which was something particularly of interest to me. And the last thing was the book is comprehensive. It covers so much of the um, every aspect really of religion. It made me feel that I'm probably inappropriate in putting myself as a religion and law scholar because I realised the old adage, if you only know one religion, you really don't know religion at all. So I felt that the book in the breadth of its coverage really highlighted the diversity within religion and also, interestingly, the interplurality or the intra-plurality is probably the better word, of religions themselves. So I often refer to Islams or Muslim communities, plural, in Australia, to reflect that diversity. But they came through in several chapters. So the, the chapter on Hinduism, for example, was Hinduisms. And the different voices within Buddhism was well explained too. Now, lastly, the editors said they chose not to speculate on the impact of the pandemic on freedom of religion and how it fits into their triangulation of the individual, the religious community and the state. But COVID dominates everything. It's dominating the Olympics. Before we came on, we were talking about COVID-19. Every news item starts with it. That's what we all discuss daily. So I wondered if I could pose, in concluding my part, a question for the editors. Do they see the coming together of faith communities in a common bond in response to the government's seemingly favouring of secular gatherings over the religious? I sort of keep in mind US Supreme Court Justice Gorsuch, such as comment, that when Hollywood may host a studio audience or film a singing competition, while not a single soul may enter California's churches, synagogues or mosques, something has gone seriously awry. Or here in Australia, where my state hosted a football match for 52,000, but restricts attendance at places of worship, prayer, limits, funerals, weddings, etc. So do you see religions coming together 
or has it created more fractures within existing faith communities? As each member sort of differs perhaps on how to accommodate state restrictions and or whether and how what ritual should be modified and in some cases even turn on each other, scapegoating other religions for spreading the virus. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But now I'd like to invite Melissa for her reflections and comments on the handbook. Thank you, um, Anne, and it's a pleasure to be here on the panel today with you all. Um, first of all, congratulations to the editors on a wonderful um, volume and to any authors who might be here as well. Um, I can't resist, Anne, just responding to you on one point, which is I think um, your comment about Australia reflects the fact that perhaps football is a religion in Australia. But yeah, let's leave that discussion for another day. Um, so let me come to my um, remarks. As I said, um, Sylvia, Mark, Arif, um, Rosella, um, you've done a wonderful job. Um, already others have commented on the impressive um, breadth, both geographically, um, spanning not only the West, but Africa and Asia, as well as across a wide range of um, religions and beliefs. Uh, but I want to focus my remarks on uh, some of the Asia chapters and contributions. Um, NUS, the National University of Singapore, is of course home to leading scholars of um, the study of Asia and law and legal systems in Asia. Um, and in many respects, I see um, the law faculty at NUS as, um, you know, one of its hallmarks is that it also welcomes scholars from around the world who specialise um, in Asia. And this is reflected in the volume. So there are three particular chapters I was going to focus on. One is by Kevin Tan, which is in um, the history section. One is by uh, Ben Shonthal on Buddhism. And then finally, the one by um, Jacqueline and Arif. So um, first of all, on uh, Kevin, um, I couldn't resist just telling one particular story about him because I think this encapsulates um, his uh, approach in this chapter. Um, when I arrived at NUS a number of years ago, um, I recall that early on, uh, Kevin took me out for lunch with another colleague. Um, they very kindly drove me to the location. And I vividly remember along the way that Kevin was able to tell me the history of the names of every street that we passed in Singapore. Um, and as many of you would know, Kevin has um, an incredible uh, historical knowledge, almost encyclopedic, um, not just of Singapore, um, but also of um, Asia more broadly. And I think his chapter in this volume again um, impressed me uh, with the scope and breadth of his historical knowledge. Um, in many ways, this is kind of the formidable um, Kevin Tan at his best. Um, he is someone who doesn't shrink from the daunting task of comparing across Asia. And, you know, I think that's no small feat given the diversity of traditions and religions um, and histories that we're dealing with in the region. Um, he in particular focuses on some of the different approaches taken by colonial authorities across Asia. Um, and including in this, he perhaps challenges um, convention by including um, the Japanese as um, colonizers. Um, I was also going to say that uh, Kevin's work, um, his book on constitutionalism in Asia actually recommended um, a chapter to one of my students the other day. Um, so his work is one that many of us rely on um, in our teaching. Um, but overall, I think this chapter is in many ways kind of signature Kevin Tan. Um, it's what he does uh, at his best. And um, I can highly recommend his historical perspective on the right to religious freedom uh, in this volume. So the second um, chapter is by uh, Ben on um, Buddhist perspectives on freedom of religion. And um, here, you know, the emphasis really is uh, perspectives um, rather than sort of the Buddhist perspective, um, as Ben very much makes clear. Um, again, uh, if I could perhaps say how I uh, met Ben a couple of years ago when I was at NUS, um, he happened to respond to a call for a conference um, a call for papers about Myanmar, except his focus was on Sri Lanka. And initially I kind of said, hold on, who is this person? He's proposing to, to submit a paper on Sri Lanka and here I am calling for papers on Myanmar. Um, but luckily I accepted his paper and um, things flourished from there. And I think Ben is someone who now is a close colleague of, of others at NUS. 
Um, and I think his work is well known to many of us, um, and particularly for his work on Sri Lanka, but also really just pioneering comparative work on Buddhism and law um, more broadly. So um, this chapter, I think, is an example of what this volume sets out to do, which is really to um, take seriously the mandate to investigate diversity and difference in interpretations of religious freedom. Um, and in many respects, Ben comes at this as a, a law and society scholar, as a religious studies scholar, um, and with really critical questions in mind. And in some sense, they're questions that I think are quite uncomfortable for lawyers because they're ones that we don't usually ask um, because we often, or courts perhaps, come to the cases that they decide with certain assumptions in mind. Um, and so he raises the very initial question around, well, is Buddhism a religion according to who? Um, and in doing so, uh, I guess, uncovers um, some challenges and, and issues in this area. Um, he goes on to provide a case study of the anti-conversion bill um, in Sri Lanka. Um, but I think overall, we come away from his chapter with an affirmation of um, a plural plurality of perspectives. Um, and I think a reminder of just how little we know given um, this diversity and variety. Um, third, then we have the chapter on freedom of religion um, from the perspective of, of Asia by uh, Jacqueline and Arif. Um, and again, uh, to um, former colleagues, um, both of them bring to this chapter a significant expertise. Um, Arif, of course, uh, is an expert on Islamic law and legal theory um, and is the author of the excellent book, Islam Law and the Modern State, uh, Reimagining Liberal Theory in Muslim Context. Um, Jacqueline uh, herself brings an impressive um, track record on religious freedom in Southeast Asia, um, and together they've pioneered um, several other edited volumes and special issues, and I think have really um, developed a strong collaboration that's a model for, um, you know, doing academic collaboration well. So, in this chapter, um, they talk a little about the ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights, um, some of the distinctive ASEAN perspectives on freedom of religion and belief, and they examine how historical and political contexts of various Asian jurisdictions have given rise to certain types of freedom of religion and belief issues and shaped states' responses to them. Um, again, like Ben, they focus on our perspectives and not simply one perspective. Um, they also sort of note some of the possible the challenges that arise. Um, they note the tendencies for um, the state to, uh, and courts to, I guess, simplify. So, uh, you know, this hope, I think, that we can treat all Hindus the same or all Buddhists the same or all Christians the same as a kind of single entity, whereas the reality is that there is great diversity um, within each of these sort of broad umbrellas. Um, so they both bring immense expertise to this volume, and in many ways, both Jacqueline and Arif are leading scholars um, in their field. Um, now, having read those three chapters, um, I found it very refreshing. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware that in Australia at the moment, um, it is a difficult time for universities. Uh, in many respects, it is potentially a time of um, decline of Asian studies in particular, which is really quite alarming. Um, and so to read this volume um, was, I guess, to be reminded of the great work that NUS does, um, their important place in the region and in generating um, scholarship on Asia, but that connects more broadly with a comparative audience um, and around the world. Um, now, I hadn't consulted with Anne, well, actually, we, we had one email exchange, but prior to this, but I was thinking along similar lines in terms of concluding, which is to say, given um, the expertise of the editors that we have here now, I was interested in their reflections on um, the COVID environment that we find ourselves in. I know they briefly mentioned it um, in the volume, but given where we are now, I wondered in your comments if you want to reflect on some of the key issues that you see going forward uh, in terms of freedom of religion and belief in your respective areas of research and how um, the COVID situation uh, relates to that. Um, obviously, there's lots of issues we could talk about there, but maybe um, in each of your areas, you want to identify one um, that perhaps is an emerging issue in the field or one that maybe is a sort of long-standing issue, but that COVID sort of continues to place emphasis on. So thanks again for the opportunity to be involved and um, congratulations. It's a wonderful volume. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, like minds think alike, obviously. 
um, on that concluding point. And also thank you for highlighting the strengths, not only of that chapter, but of the book in its entirety and the role that NUS does play and especially the Carroll Centre um, in leading the thought leaders really on this whole area of Asia, especially in law and religion. So now it's over to Nadia for your comments. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as an alumni of NUS Law, it's good to be back here, so virtually, hopefully after the COVID, uh, I can visit uh, NUS again. So uh, I'm going to focus on three chapters from this handbook. So let me start by reviewing uh, chapter nine, the right of religious freedom in contemporary Islamic thought. Uh, I have to apologize if I pronounce uh, the name not in correct way, uh, written by Wael Saleh and Patrice Brodeur. Uh, this chapter nine uh, explains uh, diversity views of Muslim scholars. It mentions that there are three groups of Muslim religiosities about the right of religious freedom. So there are uh, reformist Muslims, and then uh, the authors uh, mention the, the examples, Toba Tobai uh, from Iran, uh, Hasim Kamali, Malaysia, Said Asmawi, Egypt, uh, An Naim, uh, Sudan, and then Charter of uh, Mecca 2019, signed by uh, 1,200 muftis and scholars from 139 countries. So they label, the, uh, they label these uh, people are, uh, uh, as a reformist Muslim. The second group is a holistic activist Muslim. Uh, and then they uh, take the view that these rights, these religious uh, freedom are understood to be foreign to the Islamic tradition. And therefore they are against religious freedom. And then the authors mentions uh, Maududi from Pakistan, Said Qutub from Egypt, Osama bin Laden, uh, to name a few. And the third one is a liberal humanist Muslim. Um, so these groups uh, believe that these uh, religious freedoms are understood to be in part rooted in pre-modern Islam, including scriptural preferences, and in part the result of modern thinking on human rights. And then the authors mentions about the names of the scholars like uh, Fatih Maskini from Tunisia, the late Abdurrahman Wahid from Indonesia, the late Fazurrahman from Pakistan, two Egyptian current scholars, Saadin Al-Hilali and Abdul Gawad Yassin. Then the chapters discusses how those scholars talk about apostasy in Islam. And uh, next one is chapter 17. Uh, the right to freedom of and from religion in non-state legal orders. This is written by Martin Ramstead. And then in these chapters, uh, Martin uh, discussed that the ideas of religious freedom, just like uh, any other rights, should also be seen in a different cultural context. And even the concept, the concept of religion itself should be seen in a more broader context, not only by a Western notion of secularism. And the author said that uh, current Western mainstream societies use religion as an umbrella term for everything that cannot be conceived of, described, or classified in secular scientific terms, such as afterlife, soul, divinity, and the like. The chapter then talks about indigenous religion and some issues surrounding them. Then uh, I'm also interested in chapter 15, uh, written by Johan D. Van der Fire. Freedom of religion, constitutional patterns of protections. Uh, this chapter brilliantly surveys many constitutions in Muslim countries that talks about religious freedom, but at the same time, put Islam as their official religion or Sharia as the main source of legislation. While other provisions in those constitution say that they guarantee non-Muslims to practice their religion. So how do they reconcile this? 
And there are different models and fashions of how Islamic countries deal with the issue of religious freedom in their constitution. And the chapter went further by looking at some constitutions in Europe who has established churches such as Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and so on. The author even stated that proclaiming Israel to be a Jewish state also has religious freedom implications. The author then looked at Russia, China, and some African countries, particularly South African models. It concludes that constitutional protection of freedom of religion cannot be achieved by affording, by affording preference to a particular religion or by distancing the state from religion through secularity or the separation of religion and law, but requires of the political structures of the state to promote religions of all kinds on the basis of objectivity and therefore without affording constitutional preference to any particular religion. So having read these three interesting chapters, I'd like to offer some of my observations. So it seems to me there is no consensus amongst Muslim scholars on how Islam should deal with the right to religious freedom. At the same time, we also need to acknowledge that there is no single view about what freedom and religion mean between the Western and non-Western states and non-state legal order. There is also no standard constitutional model from the US, Europe, Muslim world, Asian and African countries of how the constitution set up the relationship between religion and the states in order to recognize the role of religion in society on the one hand and the guarantee of practicing religion on the other hand. So there is no single constitutional model. Uh, this leads us to acknowledge that religious freedom requires an understanding of pluralism. We should not promote religious freedom with the only few. Usually that means our own few, which is a dominant few due to political, social, legal, and economic privileges. Even if we have a noble intention, imposing the few is contrary to the, to the notion of freedom itself. But pluralism means more than just faith. It also implies pluralism for people based on other factors, such as ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, or social status, such as refugees or minority groups. So can we guarantee the right to religious freedom for those who are denied their presence in society due to their differences? that society could not accept them in the first place. This is the paradox, right? So for instance, if Muslims want to practice Sharia in Western countries, should we accept their requests based on religious freedom? Or if a Muslim in a particular Muslim country, like Malaysia or Indonesia or Saudi Arabia, has different views on how to interpret and practice Sharia, which is different, from the mainstream Muslim views, do they still have the right to do so based on religious freedom? From these two questions, we could sense that having religious freedom in plural or multicultural society is not easy. But if religious freedom does not lead to multiculturalism and pluralism, then I don't know what it is. A common reaction would be, but religious freedom, just like any other rights or freedom, should have some limits, right? But what are they? What are the limits? Who has the authority to limit religious freedom? Is it international law, like the ICCPR? Is it the national law, based on morals, health, and public order? Is it the scholars or authorities of the religion itself who can limit the practice of religion? Some people kill in the name of religion and others get killed because of their religion. Which one needs to have religious freedom? 
So if you are interested in some of the issues and questions I mentioned here, I highly recommend this book, Routledge Handbook of Freedom of Religion or Belief. You may not find all the answers, but at least you will understand where those questions are coming from and how the topic has been debated in a scholarly manner in different tradition, culture, and region. Congratulations to all the editors who did a good job editing 19 chapters. Congratulations also to all the authors around the world from many different backgrounds, specializations, and perspectives. It is a pleasure to read your scholarly and inspiring chapter. Thank you very much. Okay, now I've unmuted myself. Thank you, Nadia. As always, you asked all the difficult questions um, and highlighted all of the complexities, the paradoxes, the variations. And I think it's probably time that the editors who are the specialists in all of this responded to some of these uh, questions. So I'd like to move to the second part of the round table today and introduce our four acclaimed editors of this Freedom of Religion and Belief Handbook. And I'm told that Silvio um, Ferrari um, is a go-to person for all questions. So I'll definitely start by introducing him. So he is an Emeritus Professor of Law and Religion at the University of Milan. His main fields of interest are law and religion in Europe, comparative law of religions, especially Jewish law, canon law and Islamic law, and the Vatican's policy in the Middle East. He's an honorary president of the International Consortium for Law and Religious Studies. Second, I'd like to introduce Professor Mark Hill QC, who is a barrister specialising in ecclesiastic law and religious liberty. He's a lecturer at the Law School of the Open University and is a visiting professor at several universities, Cardiff, Pretoria, Notre Dame here in Sydney and King's College in London. He's written several books on religion, both historical and contemporary, and amongst his publications include a book on Christianity and criminal law, great Christian jurists in English law, contemporary, um, a contemporary one, which is religion and law in the United Kingdom, and on ecclesiastical law. He's the vice president also of the International Consortium for Law and Religious Studies. Next is Associate Professor Arif Jamal, who's Vice Dean as well of Graduate Studies at NUS Faculty of Law and is the co-editor-in-chief of the Asian Journal of Comparative Law. His research and teaching interests include law and religion, law in Muslim contexts, and legal and political theory. He's had visiting appointments with several um, eminent law schools, including with the Islamic Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School and the Centre for Transnational Legal Studies in London. Last but not least, we go to another Italian, Tarasella Bottini, who's an Associate Professor of Law and Religion, Comparative Ecclesiastical Law and Islamic Law at the Faculty of Law at University of Trento. Her research interests include law and religion, in comparative perspectives, secularism, Islam and religious minorities, religion in European and African constitutions, comparative law of religion with a special reference to the legal condition of women. So it's a formidable team of editors. And I'll now call on um, Emeritus Professor Silvio Ferrari to speak in response to the issues that have been raised by the commentators. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to um, everybody. Um, I try to answer Melissa's and uh, uh, Nadir's questions. 
um, with another question, uh, which is the question that prompted uh, me to uh, conceive this book together with uh, Jamal, Mark, and Rossella. And uh, the question is, why don't we have uh, a global history of the right to uh, religious freedom? Uh, we have uh, a number of national histories. Um, we have a few continental histories, for example, the history of freedom of religion in Europe. But we are not able to write a history of the right to freedom of religion or belief um, that includes uh, uh, the Indian Emperor Ashoka and the Roman Emperor Constantine in a comprehensive and coherent framework. We know that both of them have left an important mark on the development of the right to freedom of religion. But it is as if they belonged to two different planets, one living on Mars and the other living on Pluto. We are still unable to see the threads that connect the ideas and the actions of the one and the other. And this was, uh, um, this was fine when it took one month of sailing to reach Singapore from Europe. But it is no more, no longer fine now that time and distance have been cancelled and we can instantly connect with anyone anywhere. So in this situation, the situation I um, have uh, briefly uh, described, it was uh, almost inevitable that the global history of the right to religious freedom would be written by the most powerful actor. Yesterday and today, the West. Tomorrow, maybe the East. But it was a fake global history because it was inevitably one-sided and the pattern of religious freedom prevailing in one part of the world was projected onto all other parts. Uh, let me avoid uh, uh, any misunderstanding. I am not saying that the legal notion of religious freedom born and developed in the West is wrong or biased. On the contrary, I think it highlights a very important point, the right to follow one's conscience in religious matters without any external imposition. I'm just saying this notion is not inclusive enough of the cultural, religious, and political differences that characterize our world. This is the point I like to make. Um, writing, working on this book, I realized that to build a global history of the right to freedom of religion, we still lack of the building blocks. And this book aims to be one of these building blocks. As it has already been said, in the first three sections, it presents a reflection of this right from different historical, religious, and the socio-political traditions. And in the last two sections, it identifies the main dimension of the right to freedom of religion and the tensions um, to which it is subjected today. Uh, the book also aims to give a voice to the main actors of these traditions, 
that is Africans writing about Africa and the scholars from Asia speaking about Asia. Now, if someone, some, someone were to ask me whether the goal of the book was achieved, my answer would be only in part. Each section should have been concluded by a chapter that would synthesize the different traditions and be the first step towards the global history of the right to religious freedom I have mentioned at the beginning. We succeeded and with some limitations only in the section devoted to the different religious traditions with the chapter by Arvind Sharma entitled Building an Inter-Religious Notion of the Right to Freedom of Religion. But when we asked one of the most illustrious um, scholars of history and the sociology of religions to try to outline a world history of the right to freedom of religion, we got first an enthusiastic affirmative answer. And then when the author realized how difficult the task was, a refusal masked by the excuse of too many academic commitments. Beyond these setbacks, the challenge posed by this book proved difficult to tackle for at least two other reasons. First of all, the scarcity of histories of the right to freedom of religion on a continental level. Not everywhere has the right to religious freedom been the subject of in-depth analysis like those that have been developed in Europe. Second, we have relied on a continental filter to analyze the different legal traditions. And this continental filter turned out to be too coarse grained. In Asia, China and India are countries that are too different. And the same can be said for North Africa compared to Central Africa. I would therefore speak with regard to this book of a first step or an invitation to continue research in this direction, refining it and making it more articulated. But the goal that this book has set out to achieve remains valid, in my opinion. It is necessary to broaden the horizon and build a global history of the right to religious freedom. If not, we will repeat the mistakes of the past. Perhaps the dominant notion and regulation of the right to freedom of religion will no longer be that elaborated in the West but will become that based on the traditions of the East. But if we do not learn from our past, the same misunderstandings and impositions will be repeated. And the book is an invitation to avoid this mistake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I think from what you've just said that there needs to be a couple of subsequent books uh, to follow up on, on this one that you've started. You've started something now. Um, so at this point, I'd like to hand over to um, Mark 
So, Mark, would you like to respond to the um, issues raised? Thank you very much, Anne. I am delighted to respond. And I respond from a very gloomy London in the morning where it's raining very heavily. And my mood was a little bit gloomy in approaching this morning's uh, event because I had been quite badly bruised a week or so ago by a review I read of another book in which I was an editor. Uh, the title Anne read out in her very generous introductory remarks on Christianity and criminal law. And what that reviewer commented was nothing about what we'd written, but about what we had left out, what we hadn't included, and what he would have included had he written the book. And uh, what I want to thank all three of you for as principal speakers this morning is that you have done us the courtesy of engaging with what we have produced rather than what we might have produced or what you might have preferred us to have produced. And so my gloomy spirits uh, in the course of the last half hour have been lifted to a, to a sunny disposition. So thank you very much for having the courtesy uh, to review not only the overall arc of the book, as Anne did so beautifully in her introductory remarks, but with Melissa and Nadia following, drilling down into some of the detail of particular chapters and uh, particular uh, contributions. And I think you have um, entirely rightly identified what we saw as the unique selling point of this book in its variety, in being able to deal with a geographical range hitherto not tackled and a range of belief systems brought together and hitherto uh, not uh, tackled. And I'm delighted that having been stress tested and read by such an august panel of experts, uh, it has survived and it has survived uh, as uh, well as uh, it uh, has. Um, I'm glad that collectively you have welcomed the, the religious voices that we hear within the volume and the religious attitudes towards freedom of religion. And freedom of religion or belief, including uh, secular, non-theistic uh, belief uh, systems. Because I think historically, religious bodies have been seen as rather passive. They have been the recipients of state law as it affects religion. And some of the chapters of you have identified uh, show religions becoming a little bit more muscular in the way in which they respond to government uh, and the way in which they uh, interact uh, one with um, another. Um, and I will return to that very briefly uh, when I will attempt to rise to the challenge of saying something on COVID. The other point, and Silvio has touched on this to some degree, is the question of the secular world. Um, we are living in, in an increasingly secular world. I can resonate with what uh, Anne has said, speaking about Australia uh, and the USA, when we in London recently hosted the Euro 2000 football tournament with tens of thousands of people meeting and cheering on their teams in the stadium. Uh, and yet we are unable to go to church and sing a hymn. Uh, and bearing in mind how few people go to church these days, that's even more uh, surprising. And what we seem to find is a rampant secularism and, sec and the word secular being almost misused, where what one is looking for is a government which is neutral and an approach which fosters pluralism. And the difficulty with secularism in its true sense is that it drives out pluralism. It becomes an assertive belief system in its own way. Uh, and it means that there is little room left for the pluralism, which uh, every uh, religion and belief system uh, must uh, actively uh, encourage. Um, and I think 
in some ways, that's a small failure of the book, that although the title is clear, this is about freedom of religion or belief, quite often as lazy writers and lazy contributors, we use freedom of religion as a convenient shorthand, but an inaccurate shorthand for the true concept that we're dealing with, namely religion or belief generally matters of thought, conscience, and religion. And this book is not just about religion, as you have identified already. Uh, it goes much further in looking at belief systems uh, as, they, uh, as they are. Now, and you're right to mention COVID. We touch on it in our introduction, only because the introduction is the very last brick to be inserted into the volume, and it was right at the very end. And so uh, none of the authors had the opportunity of discussing it because it didn't exist at the time that they were preparing their, their contributions. But it has since become major and global, and it has united the world in responding to a healthcare pandemic. In some ways, it's therefore united religious organizations. Uh, because they have become aware that in the time of COVID, it encourages a more draconian form of government where freedoms are curtailed, sometimes with the active participants of the um, population at large, sometimes uh, uh, less so. And so what I think COVID has forced is religions themselves to justify their existence, to justify why their manifestation should be protected by these freedoms. Uh, and they've done that by reversing a terrible trend that we observe across the world generally, which is government illiteracy when it comes to religion. And I think uh, religions are to be praised for the fact they have argued their case not through a basic rights-based assertion, but through making governments understand why it is doctrinally that they are entitled to the freedoms uh, which they uh, should uh, have. Um, I could say a little more, but I think time is passing and I want to give my fellow editors uh, the chance to speak. But I do want to echo the final words with which Silvio finished about this being a first step. Of course it's the first step. I'm beginning to teach a course here in London on international religious liberty, and this will be the basic building block uh, for that course. And I'm delighted to have it because it makes my teaching job uh, a whole lot easier. But you'll see among the contributors, we have a stellar cast of some of the most illustrious uh, experts in the field of freedom of religion. But interspersed, we have a good many junior scholars, people who are just starting their careers as young uh, academics. And recognizing this is the first step, I think we can take a very positive stance, uh, looking at these who are coming up through the ranks, that the future of this field, this academic discipline, uh, is assured because entering it now are the young scholars who will carry the torch and do the job that Silvio has identified as being absolutely necessary if we are to maintain a global sense of freedom of religion, bearing in mind how different and varied that is seen through all the continents of the world. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. That was quite stirring. It was sort of like a political rally, really. I was uh, cheering you on there. So thank you, Mark. And also for highlighting the diversity, which I certainly didn't mention, in the contributors in terms of where they are in their career, as well as their other backgrounds. So that's another aspect to the book, which is excellent. So now let me hand over to Associate Professor Arif Jamal to give his responses. Thank you very much, Anne. It, it's difficult to follow a QC in uh, full throat, but uh, I'll do my best. So let me start by just, uh, and and try and do it very briefly so we get time for questions. Let me start by just offering a couple of thanks. Thanks, uh, Anne, to yourself 
Melissa and Nadir for, your, for engaging in this session, for engaging with the volume and for your very thoughtful comments. I also wanna thank uh, my co-editors uh, who uh, during the process we were able to collaborate uh, politely and professionally and even when we disagreed we were able not to be disagreeable uh, it was a bit more challenging when we disagreed with what the authors were saying uh, that was a bit uh, that that caused us a bit more consternation but even then one of the things that we did try to do I think in the volume in which you pointed out I think in your comments and was try to give the authors as much of their voice recognizing that their voices should come out. Uh, I want to uh, position what I see, and I, I agree with the comments that Silvio has made and Mark is, uh, has made, and particularly the idea that this is a, a first step, but going back to one of the themes that I saw that we were trying to get at, the, you know, the topic of the encounter of religious diversity and plurality, of course, is one with a long history and a wide reach. Some traditions might have it more baked into their experience or indeed uh, to their uh, theology. In the Abrahamic traditions, for example, uh, you know, certainly in the case of Islam, it comes at a time when it recognizes the existence of Judaism and Christianity and, and these different communities. The, uh, the recognition of the internal plurality uh, is which is uh, something that Nadir raised in his comments. That is uh, something that, although the historical fact is there, dealing with it uh, is something more recent. But the idea of freedom of religion and belief as a legal and constitutional value and a legal right, that is perhaps something a little bit younger. And as Silvio has says, it may have a particular sort of history coming out of a European experience. And one of the things, therefore, that I think we were trying to bring out is, if I can use this term, the genealogy of that right of freedom of religion or belief. Uh, and to try to emphasize how, although this as a formal legal right might have been grounded in a, a particular type of experience, it has also been picked up in other contexts, but in those contexts, it is being reshaped and reformed. And that is why the political, cultural, theological, and religious aspects of this right need more attention. The handbook, I think, I hope, tries to do these things, tries to bring in these different theological perspectives, the different historical perspectives, the different conceptual perspectives, and indeed now the different legal and political expressions of this right of freedom of religion or belief. The genealogy remains, I think, a work in progress. Uh, and as Silvio said, we did not fully succeed, I think, in trying to write this global history. But if the genealogy remains a work in progress, even more so, I think, is the future of what this right uh, might be, of what freedom of religion, the shape in which it will take. The enduring message, uh, perhaps, that comes in so many chapters, and this was mentioned in Melissa's comment about the chapters by Ben, ben, ben Chantal wrote on Buddhism, the chapters on Hinduism, was, and Nadir had made this comment as well, is, is this enduring message of plurality and how we deal with plurality. Uh, and that remains, I think, a, a real question. And I want to come, uh, for which I don't have a good answer, but I want to reflect on the questions that were asked about COVID. Uh, and another question that I'm going to ascribe to Nadir, which he didn't ask, but the question I'm going to ascribe to him is he raised the, the idea of, you know, if, what, if religious freedom doesn't bring about multiculturalism and pluralism, you know, what does it, what does it give us? And both the question of dealing living in this time of COVID, and I think Nadir's questions, have raised precisely the issue of how this freedom, how, how, what its contours are going to be. So Mark speaks about taking these doctrinal voices or theological voices uh, more seriously. I think I would conclude only by giving a, a sort of point of view of this. If, if consideration of freedom of religion and belief or belief does not bring multiculturalism and pluralism, or is seen to be giving anything other than that, 
it is failing to meet what I think COVID has highlighted is the even more urgent call now. That COVID has put these stresses on us in these emergencies, and we see now more urgently than ever that if these things need to be defended, they really need to be defended now. And I hope that this book has made some modest contribution towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Arif. Uh, it definitely has. And as I said, I think it's going to be the handbook or the go to book for so many of us who sort of teach and write within this space. And we can see by the way you're responding to all the questions why the book has been so successful. Um, the editors have shaped um, and the people that you have chosen to, to write the different components are why it's so successful. So to uh, have our last editor, um, I'd like to turn now to Rosella Bottini to ask her to um, comment um, on their thoughts thus far. First of all, thank you very much for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful presentation of the book. Uh, and uh, thanks to all those uh, who spoke before me because they uh, rose many interesting issues. Uh, it seems to me that uh, one common uh, issue was uh, the uh, extent to which uh, one specific right uh, or one specific gr group uh, uh, across history and today has been and is protected and included uh, in the notion of uh, freedom of religion or belief uh, as it evolved uh, historically and uh, as it is understood uh, today. Um, and referred to, um, uh, I like very much her beginning. She talked about uh, inclusiveness uh, and I like uh, to see this uh, as one of the distinctive features of the book. Uh, uh, she mentioned the five uh, major religions, the traditional African religions, uh, indigenous people, uh, secular humanism, uh, and uh, also uh, Nadir mentioned refugees, minorities, uh, and other groups. Uh, Melissa went on uh, to possibly include football uh, as a religion. Uh, that's a religion also in Italy. I would also add food uh, is another religion in Italy. Uh, so this uh, brings me to think uh, um, about uh, this question. How legal language uh, that is uh, the choice uh, of uh, a term uh, over other terms uh, may affect the extent to which one right or one group is included in this notion. Uh, I would like to make a very specific Italian example. Uh, in English, we say right of freedom uh, to religion or belief. When we translate this right in Italy traditionally, and that's how I studied this right when I was a university student, in Italy, people still talk about right to believe or not to believe, which is an expression which makes me uh, rather uncomfortable because uh, uh, secular humanists, uh, atheists, uh, uh, agnostics, uh, skeptics, and the unconcerned are not people who do not believe. They just believe in something different. So this is how legal language can also help to um, say something about the dignity we recognize to some groups. And uh, uh, since I am very optimistic, I like to see the handbook as a first step to build a common language of the right to freedom of religion or belief, uh, characterized by inclusiveness, where hopefully all religious and non-religious traditions uh, and uh, all areas in the world can contribute to the discussion. Uh, I think we never had uh, from the very beginning the aim to tell everything. Uh, Mark mentioned that uh, unfair review about uh, what was left uh, outside. Uh, Silvio talked about the partial success to write a global history of this right. Arif mentioned the future perspectives. Uh, and uh, in my view, what a book like ours, uh, well, if 
uh, a book like ours has uh, some value, I see this value not only in terms uh, of the knowledge it establishes, uh, but I like to think, because as I said, I'm very optimistic, I like to, uh, to think that the handbook has a value also in terms of inspiring and encouraging other scholars to continue to produce new knowledge. After all, if scholars told everything, leaving nothing to other scholars, there would be no longer intellectual curiosity and even worse, there would be no longer joy to study and research. Thanks. Sorry, I finished. <laughs> Thank you, Rosella. That's totally true. If a book covered everything, what else would there be left that you could write? And we're already looking forward to volume two. So um, thank you editors on doing a great job. Um, Mark, I don't think you need to worry about the reviews of this particular book, but I haven't checked the questions yet. So you never know. So I'll go to the Q&A now and uh, see what questions we have. So, um, the first question is from John Bargis, um, and he says, it was great to hear Professor Silvio Ferrari respond. The point of how Western conception that prioritizes the individual over culture and religion is not sufficiently inclusive is well taken. However, the option to not do so would end up prioritizing ideas, religions, cultures over the individual, which can become quite detrimental to individuals. He asked, would this not lead to religions and cultures becoming hegemonic, countering individual freedoms? In short, he wondered if governments can also be properly neutral without prioritizing the individuals over cultures and he's in Bangalore, India. So um, could you um, respond, Professor? Uh, yes, um, sure. Uh, and I think that my, my, my answer is uh, based on what uh, uh, Nadir Sia uh, said earlier. Um, I think there is a misunderstanding here. Uh, and the misunderstanding regards uh, uh, individual rights. Uh, let me explain my, um, my point. Um, I think that the answer to this question is sustainable pluralism. And regarding a sustainable pluralism, Europe has a lot to learn. When I speak of sustainable pluralism, I have in mind something which is based on two pillars. The first pillar is a platform of equal civil and political rights which are available to everybody without any exception. This is the foundation, the basis. The second pillar is the right of each individual to choose among a number of different options provided by the legal system to accommodate his or her conception of life. Um, it is a way of empowering individuals, not of empowering communities. It is the individual who would have the right to choose among the different ways of uh, celebrating a marriage, among the different ways of uh, uh, arrange, arranging 
um, his or her financial transactions, picking up the option that is the closest to his or her world view. The point is that, and this is a criticism of the way national states have been built in Europe, the point is that the state should not only provide the platform of equal and civil of equal civil and political rights. It should also provide different options which are available to individuals, not to communities, to uh, make use of these uh, rights. That would be my answer. Thank you for that. Perfect. Now we've got a question for Mark. So this question comes from um, Andrew in Malaysia. And he asks, um, he starts by saying, there's a sense in which the need to be respectful to freedom of religion or belief seems to be an atonement for the sins of Western colonization, which forced Christianity onto a native population and suppress the manifestation of local religions, but also affected or oppressed indigenous populations in Western countries, such as in Canada. However, he says, it also appears to be politically incorrect to reflect or point out how Islam has done and is doing the same countries, same thing in countries where it's dominant, whether through laws or otherwise. And he asks Mark, how could this be addressed? Well, I'm not sure the question is specifically addressed to me. It's the mere fact that um, Andrew and I happened to be undergraduates together 30 years ago. And this webinar uh, is a, a little bit of a schoolboy reunion for us. So um, uh, it may be one of the other panelists also wants to comment. But I think Andrew has um, rightly uh, raised uh, an issue which does concern us. For so long as we're each writing within our own national field. Um, we don't have to open our eyes to these more global points uh, that Andrew is, uh, is making. And that's why there is something genuinely adventurous uh, in the volume that we have uh, put uh, together. Um, because I think, for example, British writers uh, tend to approach this field with a degree of timidity. Uh, because they do recognize the faults of the colonial past, uh, and they do recognize that, that puts them uh, in a difficult position, uh, speaking uh, currently. Um, having said that, there are plenty of historical examples of where, notwithstanding the British colonial presence in Asia, the fostering, or at least the, the, the allowing of other religions to flourish uh, is something of a positive step, uh, which uh, might have been taken at the time. This timidity does include a reluctance to criticize the um, force of Islam uh, used in certain countries. But if you look at the chapter which Ahmed Garba contributed to our volume, uh, you'll see that that issue is addressed head on in relation to the negative effect of Islam upon the indigenous um, African religious practices. So I think you're right to raise it, Andrew. I think this is a matter which we will need to address in the future. But I'd like to think that our volume is at least a staging post to a more honest global discussion of the points that you've raised. Thanks, Mark. Arif, would you like to comment on that, especially on the Islam dimension to it? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, I do that uh, uh, with you here and with Nadir here as well, uh, but let me add my thoughts to this. Uh, I think the issue that uh, Andrew has raised 
is a, is a very legitimate issue. It is an issue that may be coming particularly out of the context in Malaysia. Of course, what we have seen, and I think what the book uh, hopefully tries to highlight is that to kind of borrow some of this language, it seems that nobody is without sin and also nobody is necessarily without virtue here. Um, because uh, in certain parts of the world, like Malaysia, where you have Islam is the religion of the Federation, that is what the constitution says. Uh, and you have uh, institutions like the, uh, the Islamic Religious Council, etc., which might be used through a variety of ways, as Andrew points out, law as well as policy and other structures, to prioritize one and impose itself, to prioritize that religion and impose itself on others. In other parts of the world, where Islam is a minority tradition, I think we've all probably here seen these uh, pictures that were circulating at one time, where you know in France they would go to the women uh, and the beach and say, you know, you must, you must actually disrobe a little bit, remove the, if they're wearing the so-called burkini, you must you know, take, uh, uncover yourself, because this is not the, the French way of doing things. And so there are any number of ways in which that freedom can be um, uh, violated. Right? And I think this is one of the things that we are trying to raise, the, the question of how, um, if, to go back to you know, my earlier comment, if indeed at the heart of trying to defend the idea or uh, expand the idea of freedom of religion or belief, which just to emphasize what Rosella said doesn't mean just religion, it means also beliefs that might be not considered outside of religion, whatever that category is. If at the heart of that is an attempt to foster a greater plurality, then you know, we must recognize that the, the language of religion or the tropes of religion could be used either for that or against that. And in some parts of the world, it is being used against that. Uh, but it's not in other parts, it might be uh, a useful antidote to use for it. Thank you, Arif. Would you like a, a last comment, Rosella, on that point before we finish? Uh, I think it's hard to say something meaningful after the uh, comprehensive, mm, short but comprehensive replies by Mark and Arif. Uh, I would just uh, um, add that, uh, uh, as Arif said, uh, I also believe that uh, probably nobody is without sins uh, or with virtues, uh, because uh, um, I see a, a more general problem. Everywhere we have uh, a dominant culture, be it religious or secular oriented, uh, uh, minorities face a risk. We cannot do anything about the past. Uh, we can just try to reconstruct it in an honest way. Uh, we may have to say something about the present. So here is where I think that scholars play an important role. Uh, you do not have a time machine. You cannot go back and change the past. But uh, as, uh, as Silvio said, we can try to learn from the past to avoid repeating the same mistakes. So um, I see problems everywhere. There is a, a majority culture which becomes hegemonic. So. Well, in many ways, that was an optimistic note on which to end because we're dealing with the present, we're looking forward and all of us can be agents of change. So it just leaves me with the, the last part of tonight, which is to thank everyone who's tuned in to this particular round table, um, and especially to our hosts at CALS and their very efficient and helpful administrative staff who've been sort of working hard behind the scenes here for the entire program and leading up to it especially to thank the four editors. Um, the book is a wonderful contribution. And as we've established tonight, it's going to be first of at least another one or maybe many volumes to come. So listening to each of you, I could see why the book has been so successful. And all of us who work in this area, thank you for the time and effort in putting it together and the skill. 
And then lastly, to thank my fellow Australian commentators. It's nice to have three Australians in this very distinguished um, lineup. It's a bit like a medal presentation, really, to have three Australians up there. So thank you to everyone. I understand, Ari, that this is being recorded. So people, if they want to watch it more, will be able to um, find it on the NUS website. So I think that's it from me. And um, I wish everyone um, happy writing in the future.